The 2024 NFL owners meeting is underway right as we speak. And right now, there's some new rules that's going to be happening in 2024 for the NFL. How will this affect the 49ers? Eh, I don't know. But I tell you what, we're going to break it right down right here on the Wayne Breezy Show. And I got a special guest, man, a good friend is stopping by. Let's get this popping, baby. So bright that we shine at. All we know is the night. Whiskey on the rocks and a 24 karat gold on a watch. My 71 Chevy B tipping non stop. Sounding like Trick Williams on the floor. So you know we can't stop. We be banging through your speakers. Wayne Breezy on the filter in the bleachers. You can tune into my show and I'm a teacher. Wayne Breezy, the phone I'm preacher. We so bright that we shining. What's going on, everybody? It's Monday, we're in the building, and the John and Wayne show is officially back on both channels. John, what's going on, baby? Where else would you rather be, man? <laughs> this, is, uh, this is the way it's supposed to happen. It's, you know, it's the first one in a while, which, you know, I blame myself. It's just been, I've been a mess, but um, yeah, I was going through all of Wayne's social media and dude's hardest working man in the business. And I texted him, I was like, dude, you are just killing it. And I freaking love it. My go-to source for almost all 49er stuff. You're before everybody. You do more than everybody. So salute to you, man. I appreciate that, bro. Listen, I don't think people really understood how the season, like all the all the work you put in, you know, to making the 49ers rush, the road trips, the home trips, just the trips, the events. All that stuff works, and it takes a toll on you. And 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 to not be able to cap it off with the Super Bowl victory, ah, so close. it was so close, right? Like I don't I don't think people really understand. Like sometimes you just got to break, like you know. And and that's what we did. Like you broke, I broke. Uh, I didn't really even want to come back on the air for a minute. Like I wanted to take a month off. You you got to take the month. I I I, I couldn't I afford to take the month. I yeah, took some time. You uh, did. What, but I was, well deserved too, John. You well deserved time. Thank well you, deserved. Thank you. Glad to be back. It's good. It's good. Guys, thank y'all so much for tuning into the show. We truly appreciate it, man. It is Monday. It could be a manic Monday, mock draft Monday, music Monday. It is just Monday. It's a it's a meeting Monday. How about that? Because the NFL owners meeting meetings are going on right now and john a lot of new rules have popped up but before we get into the show i want to shout out to the breezy bunch crew i think the countdown crew's in the building manly's in the building big daddy niners don't bother me Kali, i see you out there red jet shells in the building boss awesome. in the freaking building peachy holding it down what's going on peach our brother nick is in the building i love it i love it i love it colin is in the building jedi i see you out there baby terrence oh man mike is in the building jd's in the building guys i we can go on and on you guys are officially in the building let's drop the bomb one time let's get it going we're gonna talk about 49ers john maybe we'll have time to get into a a, a chapman esque mock draft uh but some new news have popped off with the 49ers but before we get into it let's talk about some of this nfl stuff that's going on so the owners meetings are going down and john this is when they introduce all these you know proposals uh you got the new laws coming out i want to talk about some of these new rules that they cut coming out and i want to end on this hip drop tackle situation because that's going to probably be the the hardest one to tackle uh, or whatnot, but let's. Do, are you any, familiar with this new kickoff rule thing? Do you have any? Can you give us some insight on the kickoff rule and and the touchback and getting now going back to the third? I don't know, John. Just talk about the kickoff rule. We'll go into the extra red flag of the the flag rule challenge, and then we'll finish with the hip drop tackle. So the kickoff rule hasn't been passed yet. It's still in the preliminary tinkering phase. Proposal. Good word. And, and so last year, any touchback. Whether you know you fair caught it, went in the end zone, out of the end zone, whatever, 25 yard line. So now they're trying to find ways to encourage teams to return kickoffs more so. So the first thing they proposed was look, if you just kick it all the way in the end zone and it's a touchback, they start at the 35, not the 25. And then they were like, okay, that's a little too much. So then they were like, look, if you kick it all the way in the end zone, they're going to start at the 30. So they're, they're just tinkering, hasn't passed yet. And so the way the process works, the competition committee, which is made up of 
former coaches and GMs and players, you know, well-respected people, people like Tony Dungy, Bill Poley has been on there, like lots of very, very famous like GMs and coaches. They propose all these changes. They submit it, and it's voted on only by the owners. The NFLPA can come out and say, we hate this, which they did with the hip drop. We'll talk about that. That doesn't matter. The NFLPA has no <laughs> standing on rules whatsoever. Um, it comes down to the owners. The owners are the ones that make everything happen, um, whether that's right or wrong. Uh, CBA could have been renegotiated. They missed that window. But if the owners want it, it's going to happen. <laughs> 32 owners, they do get to do the voting. And, and you're right. How, how do you feel about the rule, though? Like, So so basically, is, is it, would it make NFL – I know it will make the NFL uh, safe, more safe or safer and, and, and possibly healthier, but, but – but, how do you feel about the kickoff rule? Well, from a 49er standpoint, probably the two worst coach units in all of football for any team. Um, I know that I'm like real extreme on special teams, but we're as bad as it gets, man. Um, and we're bringing back the exact same special teams coach, special teams assistant. Nothing's going to change. So this hurts the 49ers because we need to do touchbacks on receiving and kickoff every single time because we're so bad at it. So if you're adding extra yard to these touchbacks, that hurts the Niners considerably. But I still believe the Niners should just touch back every time because they're so bad at it. Uh, but this would be more kickoffs, which I think the NFL wants. So I, I, I miss the football where you get the possibility of a guy returning the, the kickoff 101 yards if yeah. it's kicked into the end zone or, you know, things like that. Like, I, I still think that needs to be a part of football. Um, but if you feel like this is going to hurt the Niners, in a sense, I kind of get where you're coming from. Maybe they get a little bit better by drafting somebody that it's just a return specialist or still signing free agent. Whatever. Who knows? Um, but, you know, it comes down to the actual coordinator and making making it just a better unit like you know what i mean but we can talk about what the niners did especially on special teams because they did add some players that i think would benefit the special teams and they re-signed a couple of players that i think help make the special teams core strong uh but we'll get into that all right so that's the kickoff rule that's kind of pending as of right now they haven't voted on it as of yet let's go to this third challenge rule now because that's a little different right and the previous rule if i'm not mistaken is you get two challenges a game if you get both of them right i believe you get a third one but now there's three challenges because if you get one right you'll have the option to get in a third john like this is this is going to make the nfl game longer right no it could it doesn't happen a lot it, it, with the nfl because you've they've upped the automatic you know, re replays, all scoring plays, all, you know, change of possession plays, everything within the two-minute warning. So, like, the window for challenges is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, which is good. Um, and I, I think the main reason is they don't want to penalize coaches for refs' mistakes. And Ooh. so I think that this might happen, I don't know, like for the 49ers, th this might involve two games a year uh, where the third challenge would come into play or anytime you're playing the Chiefs and the refs just don't do things. Um, something along those lines. But, yeah, I, I don't – a little bit longer, but nothing too bad. I, I, I'm i not too concerned about this one. Yeah, it's just an extra challenge, and the coach the coach has got to get it right, right? I mean, they, they got to get it right. And, you know, I, I'm not saying – if you look at the 49ers, I'm not saying that Kyle even used the challenges in the first place. But this gives them an opportunity for coaches to use the challenge, knowing if they get one right now, they have the the ability to have an extra one uh, in the 60 minute game. So I'm kind of I'm actually kind of digging this new rule. Like, yeah, like this, this kind of new rule is kind of cool. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm kind of digging it. And again, it's not going to affect the game too much because not many coaches don't use the challenges anyway. Like they got to have that cool, super, you know, Intel that to when they even use the challenge. Uh, but we'll see what happens with it. All right. Let's let's spend a little bit Real of time. Quick, on you know how many times Kyle challenge plays this past year? Six, five, four. One of them numbers. One. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> one time um, it was on a fourth and four. Um, I remember against Royce Freeman. Yeah, there we go. 
And that I remember. Was the, that was the Rams game that didn't matter. I, so the I, I time we challenged was the game that didn't even matter. Didn't matter. Um, I wish there was a, a – I, I, you know what I wish they would change? I wish you can challenge other things like the PIs, things like that. Like I feel like – why do you think that's not being adjusted to the NFL ruling? Well, the the one thing that was talked about, and again, this hasn't – I don't think it's passed yet. I could be wrong. But the egregious pass interference uh, – not pass – sorry, egregious um, roughing the passer – and intentional grounding. So those two, there, and then the verbiage that was used from the um, competition community was egregious. Like where somebody gets flagged because they got hit in the head, you know. Mm-hmm. And so, like, if you could review it and see that he actually didn't touch him in the head, they'll overturn that. If he was outside of the pocket or not, that's going to be reviewable. Things like that. So that I'd like it. I'm with you. The further you get the hand, the game out of the refs' hands, the better it is for fans and teams. The agree. refs play way too big a role in almost I, all major sports. All the all the major sports. I agree with that one hundred percent. And and you know, I, I can dig it. I can dig it one hundred percent. John, um, I think the, the 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 most controversial of the rulings and, and let's talk about the pros and the cons is the hip drop tackle being banned from the NFL and if it happens there are some consequences, and I want to talk about the consequences, but let's talk about the pros, right? And so um, what are the pros of this tackling or this ruling uh, for the NFL moving forward? Um, offense, okay, so this will generate more points. You're making the game much harder on the defense, especially the secondary. Um, so if we're looking at it from a 49ers standpoint, I think that this benefits the 49ers considerably because we have all the yak guys. We have Christian McCaffrey, Juwan Jennings, Debo, Ayuk, Kittle. Like those are the types of guys that DBs have to bring down from behind because they're so physical. Okay. So more points, it's tougher to tackle. It's harder on the defense. That's all pros for the NFL. And then probably the thing that they'll hide behind is injuries. This will limit injuries. And I, I do think that that is a good thing, but sometimes you can go too far. And I think we're always in that tension. You know, I'm not one of those people that's like, oh, I might as well just play flag football. I disagree with that. But the game's going to continue to get softer because the only thing that can stop this NFL train momentum on revenue and taking over the world is injuries. That's it. DeMar Hamlin type stuff. Does this stop that? I don't think so. But – Less injuries are a good thing. In theory, the opportunity cost of that is, man, how the hell do you tackle? And that's the question, right? And and we have a question, you know, um, from, from our friend Mark. You know, question, how are you supposed to stop someone when you're trying to catch them from behind? And this is when you literally see this hip drop tackle kind of take place from behind, from the side, uh, things like that. Not really head on but more from the side, mainly from behind when you're trying to catch up. Like, when you're trying to catch up from behind, like if you're chasing a wide receiver down the field, how do you stop them from behind? Uh, and, John, let's let's talk about the first part of the question. Like, h- how are you supposed to do it? Like, how are you supposed to tackle from behind if you can't drop your hips? Because the way I'm seeing it and I'm trying to envision it without you answering the question yet is – you get them from behind. This is going to sound nasty, so I'm pausing all the way through this. And you plant your feet in the ground. Now you could probably get an injury from doing something like that. And you got to try to body slam it, which would be a penalty. I'm, I'm curious to know the John Chapman take on this. You know, from a coaching standpoint, like – before the pads come out, you do tackling circuit, right? And I know at high school level, college level, NFL, they, they don't even do tackling really drills anymore or shoulder pads anymore in the NFL. They don't even do it. But one of the like first fundamental things you do is called a gator tackle or a roll tackle. And lots of teams put their own, you know, mascots names on it, but that's the original was Florida, um, where literally you pull a pylon and you run behind it, you wrap up and you roll. Litter gator roll, right? That was the idea. And so I think a lot of that's still in play. The problem is, and Rich McKay, um, you know, he's in the competition committee and he's the one that suggested this and how they're going to use this official wise. You could still wrap up and drop 
you just can't wrap up and drop on the player's legs. Okay. So you can wrap up and drop to the side, almost like, again, more difficult rules for Nick Bosa, right? You can sack the quarterback, but, but you as you're sacking the quarterback, yeah. you got to roll to the side. Yeah, you can't and land so, on top of them. Yeah. And, and it's just this constant, and this is my biggest issue. I'm going to go a little off topic here, Wade. If it's about injuries, which the NFL claims it is, then you're banning the tush push. You're banning leveraging players against each other. You're doing all that. Like, th this, it's not about injuries. Okay, it, injuries are a part of it. But that's not what it's about. It's all about helping the offense to get more points. So once this happens and it's a personal foul, 15 yards, free first down, more opportunity to score points. It's interesting that you said that because I was saying to myself, the tush push remains, and all I can think about, uh, you know, are the head injuries, <laughs> and like the concussions and the things that can come out of that, which – Clearly, it's okay, but you're talking about a tackle where the player doesn't. Like, I think it was like a 25% rate to where the player might get hurt on something like this, to where a player is going to actually land on it. Like, it literally doesn't happen on purpose, right? Like, like okay, let's talk about the Jimmy Ward tackle on the Tony Pollard because I really feel this hip drop thing has been going on for a long time and no one has complained about it until that game. And Jimmy Ward makes the tackle on Tony Pollard. It was a playoff game, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. And it then was. he's out for the begin re remainder of the game at the very beginning. He's out for the, you know. And next thing you know, boom, it's starting to happen. People are starting to, you know, be more aware of it. I'm looking at, when you look at the tackle, I mean, we can't show it because of the NFL film. But if you look at the tackle, you're saying to myself, all Jimmy did was literally do exactly what you said. And I don't remember him literally landing on Tony Pollard. Well, the video that they released with about 20 tackles showing what they want and they don't want. I did that see the that. Second one. That yeah, was the second one. It was. They do not want. Okay. Um, but the first one was a Cowboys defender doing it to another teammate, which I thought was interesting. Uh, it's almost like the NFL is trying to show, look, we're not doing this just because the Cowboys, the, the Cowboys did wrong here too. Like the, the NFL understands what they're doing, but I'm with you. Uh, Cowboys start complaining, and Jerry Jones has the most pool of almost any. Uh, he has the most pool of any owner in the NFL. You just look at the finances, and the, he basically pays Roger Goodell's salary by himself. Uh, I know that's not <laughs> what it is, but whatever Jerry what Jones says goes. It goes. Uh, period. Yeah. yeah, he's got to go. Uh, but yeah, no, I I totally get where you're coming from. I just I just feel like. It's, it doesn't become red flagged until the 49ers doing it. And you could say I'm I'm whining or whatever. Cool, I don't give I don't care. But it just seems like it doesn't get put on blast and out there in front of everything. Because, all right, this has nothing to do with these rulings. But when you go back, remember the play where uh, uh, Trent Williams pushed Leighton Vander Esch and apparently that's what caused him the injury and caused him to retire. But nobody's going back and watching – Leighton Vander Esch's injury history, realizing that he's been injured the majority of his career. Like, I mean, that might have before he even came into the draft. So I, I, I you know, it, it's just it just seems like when the Niners do something, it's got to be put on blast. Cool, whatever. Back to this ruling. I don't know how I feel about it. Like, it's weird because, like, I just feel like it's another, it's another thought and the players' minds, defensive players' minds, and potentially offensive players if there's a turnover and they got to make the tackle on the interception or fumble return or whatever. But when you're tackling, it's just like, dang, I got to make sure if I am tackling, I got to drop my hip. I mean, I, I can't land on the player, basically, with my weight. That's what the tackle is. You can't land on the player with your damn right. weight. That, that's what it is because that can cause the injury. But it's just like, dang, like, you, you – you, you got to think how you tackle like that's that's tough. It's hard, man. And like it, the, the issue is this. I don't think. And again, the competition committee, every time they institute a new rule, they always recommend fines over flags so that, yeah, the, this will be flagged, but they would much rather it be something that's reviewed and then find after the fact yeah. to try to remove it from the game. Uh, very similar to horse collar stuff or head-to-head -head stuff. There's going to be some flags. The egregious ones, that's going to take place. However, they would like this to remove itself from the game through fines um, and players just being docked financially, which th that's a hard thing too because that just affects 
the back end of the draft guys that are in the league for one to two years. It doesn't affect the rich dudes, but but anyway, see, that's all nice. we, and that makes perfect sense to me, John. And it's clear, it's vivid, right? But when you talk about the horse collar, I mean, come on, like we know what that is. Like you, you can see, grab the back of the back of the neck, pull down, like that. That's all. You can't really see the hip drop tackles. What I'm trying to say, like that, quick. It does. It happens so fast. So my here's my concern, and then we'll get to Barakas's uh, statement. Here's my concern. Never mind the players. Now you got the officials having. They already struggle, right? They already they suck, and now they have to have another ruling to which they have to rule on in a game that they don't even really can tell. Can that happens in real time? Like they like, dude. It's not like. They can tell that it was a hip drop tackle. Like how? how now, explain to me how they gonna know? Like other than the person landing on the weight and the person getting up getting injured. That's to me the only way they'll be able to tell or determine if it's been a hip drop tackle. Yeah, and you're making it harder on them and their part time employees. The NFL refuses to go to full time employees. They don't have Wayne Breezy work ethic. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> like they're they're not. <laughs> <laughs> They're not putting in the time and the elbow grease and all of that it takes to be at the top of their craft. They're part-time employees. You know what I mean? And so it, I, it's just there's so many contradicting ideas and concepts that the NFL is putting out there at the same time. Oh, it's safety, 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 safety. We want a better game. We want a better game. That's not true. They want more points, and they want less injuries. And whenever it comes down to one of those two things, they're going to go with more points and a lot more, you know, excitement, drama. That's what they want. That's what they want. Yeah. Um, and you said that is this finable too? Yeah. Did you say okay? So that oh, so that's it, how they want it regulated. So more fines than flags. That's what I was going to say. So more points, less injuries, more money. More, more money, problems. more problems. <laughs> more money, more, more money, problem, more, more money. money no. Yes, that was my <laughs> joint. All right, <laughs> that was my joint. All right, so uh, Baraka says it seems like the more rules, the more injuries. He says, you know, and for people that have been watching football for over, let's say, two, three, four decades, okay, that's 20, 30, 40 years of football, and there's been, and there's more. Um, I don't remember all of these injuries 20 years ago. I could be wrong. But I don't remember it. It does seem like, John, the more rules they implement, the more injuries we're getting. But I don't know if it's from that. Like, I, I just feel like when the NFLPA eliminated a couple of things due to the players complaining, uh, not complaining, but just not, you know, not being compensated right, like things like that, like the two a day practices, they really get in their bodies conditioned to withstand NFL hits. Now you're adding an extra game. Uh, the season and they're trying to go with two more games per season. I just feel like all of that's taking a toll on their bodies and causing these injuries. But 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 what are your thoughts on this? You know, I think players are getting bigger and faster. Yeah, that's you know, they're you evolving. look at the combine and every year it's just like ooh, ooh, ooh. Right. And now you've got wide receivers getting smaller and smaller, ball carriers getting smaller and smaller, even quarterbacks. You, you know, the the nineteen eighties quarterbacks of the six five, two forty, everybody looked like freaking Ben Roethlisberger and Jim Kelly and whatever else. Now you got Bryce Young out there, can't even ride a roller coaster. So, like, you're getting these extremes, and I think that's going to bring a lot more injuries. I don't think the not hitting the quarterbacks, right, the roughing the passer, I think that those are good things, but it's frustrating. This can be a good thing. I'm not a fan of it. The players aren't a fan of it. The NFLPA was completely outspoken against it, but the owners are for it. Why? Because whenever stars are in uniform, you sell more tickets. Tony Pollard gets injured. Not as fun. Not as fun. Yeah, I'm on both sides of the fence here. I always want it to be safer, but it's just like, come on, man. Like, the reason why we love football is because we get to live out our inner barbarian self and this this gladiator-type mentality, right, as we watch these games and we get all pumped up. You keep removing more and more and more. Not that we're going to be at flag football. I don't think that's the case, but I, agree. I don't know. I don't know. I, I agree with you. I don't, I don't think it's going to be at f- to the level of flag football, but it just seems like the NFL is is becoming more of a staged event. Like, you know, when you watch wrestling, yeah, they be getting slammed and they be getting chopped and hit and all that type of stuff. But 
it's controlled. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's kind of like staged. I don't want the NFL to get out of that. Like, I don't want the NFL to go that route because this is football, man. You're talking about, you, you know, two, you know, people colliding, trying to, it, it just, it can't, it can't be, it can't go. So you can't make football soft. You know, I do want them to protect the players. I do want the players to, to remain as healthy as possible, but you can't take out the, initial reason why they even play the sport like it's full contact it's not semi-contact it's not quarterly con it's full 100 percent contact that's going to come with some type of repercussions of injuries and so just don't make the game boring i think that's what it comes down to for me like don't make the game boring don't and don't make it too complicated to where these young guys who've been doing things a certain way their whole life have to flip the switch and change it just like that i mean that I, I just that's really putting kids in the grind we'll move on from that but those are the main things um that have been discussed so far um at the nfl um the meetings that are going on let's talk about some 49ers news john uh let's talk about start with jed york right so jed york is now <laughs> he he okay so ceo jed york will become the principal owner of the team after buying sufficient equity from his mama uh, miss mrs debartolo york uh placing him in charge of the team so this whole time this whole time jed york was the owner but not fully in charge he was put he was put in charge by mama right and so like that's that's the thing like whatever i don't even want to mention their names screwed up everything and they said, all right, we can't do this. And that was the whole Dennis Erickson stuff, which drove me crazy still to this day. I think the 49ers' worst coach of all time. I don't want to go down that road. But then they were like, all right, let's let little man do it. And he he took his lumps. And, like, I'll be honest, I think the 49ers have one of the better owners in the NFL. And now he's a principal owner. And, you know, owners don't get fired. Look at Jerry Jones. Dude would have been fired. Looks like he'd been fired 30 times, literally. But he would have been let go a long time ago. He even said that he would have been fired. Do you see his scribbles on the pad? Did you see the picture no. of Jerry Jones? No. They took a picture of him at the owner's meeting. And he had a notepad in front of him, and it just had scribbles. Like I'm not. So even he was joking. doodling. He it was doodling, but it was like they're taking a picture, like he was like doing something really authentic or something. Like wow, look at this guy. He's taking notes in this meeting, and you can see the scribbles, and it's just like good lord, like an etch a sketch gone wrong. Go look up the picture. It's pretty comical. And, okay, uh, I, I promise I will. <laughs> I'm sorry. I will make fun of Jerry Jones every single chance I will ever have the opportunity. As you He's should. A horrible As you should. Human being. Uh, I can't stand that man. But anyway, Skeletor, long live. Uh, anyway, I digress. I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna stop. Skeletor was one of my one of my favorite villains too, by the way. But Jerry Jones isn't, but Skeletor was definitely one of my favorite. Okay, I gotta ask you this. I go off topic. You mentioned things. I'm sorry, my brain ADHD. It's my fault. Skeletor versus Mumra. Oh. That's got to be difficult. Oh, and if I if I really want to make it more difficult, I got to add in Megatron or Galvatron, whichever one you want to call him. Ah, uh, I the bad the main bad guy always wins, so I'm going Skeletor. That's a I fact. Like, yeah. Wait the know. hell. I'm just saying. It was. Written. I think that's why we watched the show because we always <laughs> wanted to see the good guy win, but the good guy <laughs> never won. Never Good did. point. Sorry, go off tangent. Those that's watching the show or listening to the show, I want to know what you love think. Love the Megatron love. Love the Megatron love. Skelet I want to know. Best villain, cartoon villain, and, and I only picked them three because them the ones that stand, stood out the most. G.I. Joe had too many bad guys, but I could have said Cobra Commander, but I really thought that uh, uh, Destro was worse than Cobra Commander, but that's just me. But anyway, what you guys think in the chat? You listen to the show. Make sure you go ahead and leave a, a comment. All right, John, let's get to so so Jed York is the is the official primary owner. Make the decisions. Leave me alone, Mama. I done got my bank account up, and now you can't say anything. I'm buying this. So I, I, I'm we're moving forward. What do you think he's going to do? What, what, what do you think this does to the longevity of the team now that he has full control? Like, does Kyle Shanahan just remain the, the longest tenured 49ers coach of all time? Are they, like, really good friends? Like, I'm just curious to know what John is thinking. You know, fewer cooks in the kitchen. I think that's huge. And, you know, I always have some of my, you know, uh, foil hat wearing, you know, uh, conspiracy theorist listeners that will always reach out to me and say, oh, 
you know, Miss York's in the building. If Jed doesn't turn it around, she could take it away from him. This just removes that. And I don't think that that was ever really the case or even going to take place. But now the other family's still owners. He's just the principal owner. So he owns more shares than everybody else. So he is the chief decision maker. He already was. But now nobody can take that away from him. I don't think that this is a bad thing. Oh, Master Shredder. Uh, I missed that one. I miss, I dressed up as Shredder one time. Thanos. Yeah. See, Thanos say- wasn't an official bad guy. He was bad, but he like he has some yeah. good tendencies. That's why I didn't I didn't want to mention Thanos. You yeah, know. I'm staying away. We talk that. about straight straight up deceivable villains. Like straight up. And I and Venom, even though he was bad, it just seemed the movies made him good. And then uh, I was just like, nah, he's a good guy. It was the suit. <laughs> I'm with you there. So I, I'm with you there. My bad. Didn't mean to go back. Over. I was just popping that up as you talked. Didn't mean to throw you off. Keep going. <laughs> no. So uh, and, and uh, I just want to stay with this idea that like I think that this is a good thing personally. Um, I don't think it's going to really affect too too much, but it just gives him a little bit more confidence to do what he wants. And whenever Kyle Shanahan went to Jed York and said, "Look, we want to trade up for Trey Lance and keep Jimmy G," that was crazy. Both of those options turned out to be wrong, but Mm -hmm. I want a franchise that will swing for the fences. I don't want to be the Saints that are just perfectly fine with almost winning a division every year. I don't want that. That's not what I want. I want a team that is willing to do whatever it takes. And I think Shanahan, even though he hasn't won at all, he's right there on the doorstep. And I think Jed York has been okay with the very, very aggressive move. So I think this is a positive thing. I really, really do. I do, and I, I, you know what I really like, and we don't really talk about this, the connection. Like, you you, you know, Jed York has grown, uh, and he's progressed into, I think, a really good owner in the NFL. And, yes, he's about his bread. He's about making the money. He's about making sure that the, the money's rolling in because they got bills to pay, like, you know what I mean? But he's also allowing – uh, the the head coach, the general manager, to focus on football. So he kind of stays out of it. He comes into the locker room, he greets his players, says hello, daps them up, you know, roots them on. And then other than that, like it, it's it's that's it. That's where the line draws for him. It stops right there. And he allows his coaches, he allows the general managers, he allows the people that he puts in, you know, that that he hired to do their job. There's no micromanaging. I don't get from Jed York and I'm hoping now that he's this full owner or whatever, like he's not going to develop into that type of micromanaging type of a person. You hire a coach and if you're, you done extend it, Kyle Shane, this is the second extension, John Lynch, second extent, you done extended them a couple of times. I feel like the trust is there. You know, I've never seen a head coach in my entire life trade three first round picks Draft the quarterback, trade that quarterback, and keep their job. Like I've never seen that before in my entire life. So I really under I really believe there's some type of trust that Jed York believes in Kyle that they will get over the hump, right? They'll get over this little hump. They'll get the Super Bowl down uh, and things like that. And, and and I'm hoping, like you said, I I believe that this will be a great thing for the San Francisco 49ers. John Lynch spoke, John as well. At the uh, the owner meetings, and he talked about you know he gave us some injury updates. The George Kittle, uh, Charverius Ward had some procedures, uh, and they're looking to be ready to go. Uh, you know, week one and and full go too, right? Um, come core practice. muscle surgery, both of those guys. Yeah. Core muscle. What is that anyway? Like that. They're just trying to develop their abs to look like that of John Chapman, which is, uh-huh. you can't do that unless uh-huh. medically. You uh-huh. know, that's how so they they out. got him like drawn in like like they got them placed i'm gonna put an ab That's here right. an ab here <laughs> you're gonna put a f- <laughs> so they got six 12 packs done medically i didn't know you could do that like i know we're playing but like shoot what's Just the cost saying, hey kittle ward let me know how much it costs can you put me on y'all plan i think i want to get some abs all right so let's talk about greenlaw who's uh apparently greenlaw's mine he ready to go we won and i believe it like, I believe he will be ready to go week one. That's just my theory process coming from the Achilles injury. I don't see how that's possible. But if you know Dre Greenlaw, like we know Dre Greenlaw, you know Dre Greenlaw, that is what he's preparing to do. And I think he'll be ready. But John said it will more than likely him being on the PUP list. So what are your thoughts on Dre Greenlaw? I thought this was the most significant news of the day, to be honest with you. Um, I thought it was the most important for the 49ers. 
yeah, the injuries, you put them on the pup because that just gives you an extra roster spot. That makes it simple. So he's going to start on the pup, you know, whenever you go through the offseason and trading camp and all that, he's going to be on the pup. Work it off on the side. He'll be the first one out there. And, you know, we'll, I'll be at trading camp. I'll be, you know, filming and putting all that stuff out there. But if he's ready for week one, that'd be awesome. I don't think that that should be. I understand for players why that's the target paycheck and all that stuff. You don't want to miss time, whatever else. But I would not be shocked if he misses a game or two. But because he's on the pup, guess what? It doesn't cost those roster spots. So there's no need to rush this back. Now, here's the thing. Do you draft according to Dre missing a month or Dre being there week one? Because you got a lot of linebackers. You, you got a lot got, of linebackers. There's no room for more linebackers on this roster. You are freaking loaded. I I agree. Ah, fuck, I, can say it. I agree. But. I, I, all right, let's just count them, right? Fred Warder. I, I agree. I, I can't Greenlaw, disagree with you about what you Campbell, just said. Campbell, uh-huh. DFF, uh-huh. right? You got D. Winters, Winters and Graham. then you got Jalen Graham. Yeah. That's a yeah. lot of cats. It's a lot of cats, but if you if you, if you you know the Kyle Shanahan that I know, they'll draft a linebacker. I think they will, too. <laughs> like, will like too. yo, competition is key, and, you know, not just for the second year players people thinking that oh yeah they're going to draft the linebacker and this is this means d winters or Jalen graham won't make this roster no it doesn't this means that they're going to bring in another type of a linebacker what if they go out and look for a dre greenlaw-esque type of a linebacker for the future now I, apparently that's supposed to be d winters right but i mean he was a late draft pick what was he six round six round you don't stage your future on that he flashed and i like him yeah and he's got the exact same damn body type as drake greenlaw but he don't play like drake greenlaw john Nobody i'm just does. i'm just saying there 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 can potentially be some prospects available in round three or three so four. let me ask you this if they oh. took a linebacker in the third round how uh, would you feel about that it the, tell me the linebackers nah. give me some names this is see we talk said you're gray we talking see, Jeremiah Trotter Jr. We, we talk about I, just, I hate that value. I hate that value. Where do you have him going? Fourth? Yeah, I, I don't like this linebacker class. There's some guys that like. Yes, right. 100% but, correct. Like, my favorite linebacker is Cooper. So, fun. that's the kid out of Texas a and So, if you're not getting him, you can kind of wait. You know what I mean? Like, eh, uh, But if you draft a guy like Cedric Gray... You know what I'm saying? You you're you're gonna get two things. You're gonna get a tackling machine and a miss tackling machine. You the same thing. Like he over pursues, he's gonna miss tackle, but he's hella athletic. Right. He has great football speed. I don't care if he ran a four six in the forty. His speed on the field is that. He diagnoses a play, but sometimes he's too fast. He'll break it down. I like. We're gonna get into some draft talk. I like this. I need draft talk from John Chapman for the remainder of this damn show. So I need now, that. Real quick, there's one more thing I want to bring up. Matt Barrows tweeted this out while we were live. Um, John Lynch said Daryl Luter Jr., Isaac Yadam, and Ambry Thomas will be competing for the outside corner spot. I told y'all, mother suckers. Listen. I, I, I believe Ambry's on his way out. I believe he's on either on the bubble or the trade bubble. Two bubbles. Cut bubble, trade bubble. I think they're you going to try. last year too, though. I did. And I'm going to stick to that. But Luter Jr. and Yadam are the same player. Now, the difference between the two is Yadam professionally did it, at, you know, in real games. Like, he's done it in games. But that is exactly what I've been saying that Luter can do. Will he get the opportunity to do it? Last year he had the injury as a rookie, but he did get some burn, did make some boo-boos out there on the football field. So we'll see, but I guarantee you they're going to be competing for the outside spot, but let's have this conversation because does that mean that they're kicking Dion Maduro Lenore inside? I think they're going to keep him where he could kind of do both. I think they want to draft a nickel corner, and that's why when you talk about like a linebacker in the third, I'm like, ah, that's a starting nickel. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not say I would draft one, but right. If Cooper is there, like <laughs> it, it, it depends on the nickels available. Like right. if Mike Sanders still is gone, 
If if Jerry and Jones are gone, I gotta really like think who am I looking to play nickel? And I like the speed of Daquan Hardy out of Penn State, but the question is, is that too high to draft him? So who do you have? See, that's a, my favorite thing about this draft is the nickel guys. Max Melton, TJ Tampa. I think they'll be. Oh, gone. so you like Max in the nickel? See, I like him I'm outside. Fine. I like him both. Okay, like, I, I, feel I didn't like, he's I, like a demo I did, guy. Okay, I got you. I got you. I like I Andrew get... Phillips out of Kentucky. I think that he fits pretty good. Um, there's guys, Renardo Green, a little bit later. I like Green from Florida State. Yeah, like we're talking. Like, and th- that's the thing that's so cool about this is the NFL trickles down a little bit with the rules, but the play style trickles up from high school. Right, the spread and all that stuff, and the zone read that started at the high school level. Then it goes to college. Then it gets to the NFL, and that's what we're seeing now with these nickel sub package corners, where it's it's building up into the NFL. And this draft, I think, reflects that. Yeah, like I agree. Like I, you know, I'm big on drafting the nickel. I feel like, I mean, I, I, I you got like if I'm the Niners and I see Sarah still on the board. Like it's a no brainer for me. Like it's just it. You really will have a starting nickel back as a rookie. Like you could literally put them out there. Now, I do know the Niners. They'll look at a safety that can play both. They'll look. They'll look at a person that's more versatile than getting like the best like person at the position. And that's what confuses me about Lynch and 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 how they make their decisions and stuff like that. Like you know what I'm saying. Uh, Hugo wants to know if Brownlee plays nickel. I have him as an outside corner, but. So in my notes, my biggest, I don't remember what game it was. I felt like he's worse against speed guys. Um, and I thought he was real scrappy. I, I wrote scrappy, tough. Um, and so I put may struggle to play outside at the next level. I think he's one of those just versatile guys that doesn't have a true home. And that's why he's going to go day three. Yeah. Um, but I like him. Six, one, six foot, 190. Yeah. That's exactly what the that's, Niners like out of their corners. That's what they like out of their corners. I'm a big Andrew Phillips guy. Right. I mean, at the Senior Bowl, he played outside and he was phenomenal. Like, and so like, but this is the same thing I saw out of out of uh, Darrell Luter Jr. And so I'm glad that they're not forcing him to kick him inside because he's aggressive. And so he is not going to get beat on the outside. But this is how I look at Andrew Phillips. I know he's what six feet. He's a little little short. One eighty seven, six foot. Yeah, but this kid isn't like he has the ability, as the athleticism. He's a guy to play outside. Will they kick him inside? Possibly. So I don't know, man. Like I don't know with the forty two inch vertical, man. Bro, the dude is a motherfucking <laughs> athlete. Bro. Yeah, he's just you know when I go to the senior Niners bowl. Right. And you know, when I go to the senior bowl, like if I find a player that just sticks out, like I'm supporting that player until they're not drafted by the Niners. Like that, that's just how I look at it. And I found about three or four of them. And it's funny because three of the four are all defensive players. Like it's not that I went there to look for defensive players. It's just that they did some things like. There was, they, the Niners need to look at these players, but he did meet with the 49ers. So that, that's something to, to keep an uh, ear out to or, or eye on uh, as you as they prepare for the NFL draft. Let's keep talking draft talk, John, because, uh, you know, let, let's 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 do this first. Let's talk about Brandon Ayuk, because in my opinion, this can this can help the draft class of 2024. Um if, if something goes down. But John Lynch spoke about uh, no trade talks for Brandon Ayuk, and they're working out, they're working on getting to the points where they're working out, you know, the extension, right? They want, he wants him here. He wants him in the house. He wants him in the building. He wants him here long term. Uh, and so, what are your thoughts on Brent, the, the Brandon Ayuk situation? Never mind the rumors. I could care less about the Steelers or the Jaguars. Brandon Ayuk as a 49er moving forward. We know that it's going to take time. Yeah, they have full leverage. They have all the leverage. They can do whatever they want. He's under contract $14.1 million guaranteed this year for injury. So you don't have to do anything. And the Niners will slow play this until after the draft. Unless they get blown away, they slow play it. And look, you just let them play on this. Then you control them next year. You can franchise them. If he goes off and improves, that's, you franchise them. That's two them. years, man. That's two years. Yeah. You've got control of Ayuk for two years, whether that's fair or I like it or what he deserves. That's a whole nother thing. Oh, we got Rob Louder uh, in the chat. That's hey, Rob. That. What's up, man? I love that dude. Um, But, you know, I, I'll, I think Ayuk's here to play. I really, really do. And all the posturing and all the stuff and whatever, I don't really care. 
he's under contract. And if you get a home run deal, take it. But why would you give away Brock Purdy's number one toy if you're going to base this entire future of this franchise off of him? Why would you take that away? I, I just it makes it makes it makes zero sense unless you're getting an offer to where not that you're going to replace IU because I, I you know I don't you can probably try to replace his production but you'll never be able to replace him as a player like it's two different things like you know you you can try to make up some of the things that he does out there on the football field but Brandon Ayuk is another is another one of, one of one right <laughs> they just not a better wide receiving blocking wide receiver in the NFL than Brandon Ayuk maybe Jawan Jennings but they play on the same team you get what I'm saying and then there's like the the, the kid's wingspan the, the, his ability to get open like that's just uncanny uncanny right like and so I don't think you can replace that. You can replace him as a player, but you can try to find a way to replace the production uh, if you did try to move on him. But you have to literally, the 49ers would have to literally get blown away by a deal. It's not, it's not just a, a, a mid-tier first-round pick. It's going to have to be something else on the back end. And then the Niners might have to give up something. to. I don't know. It's just it's just weird. I don't even want to talk about it. Rob, what's going on? He says, Nicholas is so specialized. I prefer to draft one. Uh, you've seen play that role rather than, you know, project or project. So project I'm, that. Yeah. I, I agree with him. And that's why, you know, I'm talking about one that played consistently. I'm talking about one that literally lined up majority of the stops i'm not talking about like one more snap me and the majority i'm talking about predominantly lined up and that's where mike sandra still stick stands in and i don't know if teams are going to be looking at him to draft him specifically as the nickel role but the niners this is what makes the niners draft so dope right they filled every position they literally have zero holes but they can stand to upgrade at certain positions so you said round three, but if Mike Sandra still is staring you in the face in round two. And it's Rake Straw, Rake Straw, I'd be happy with oh, him. Like, oh, I my gosh. It. Yeah, yeah. I don't care if they go round one if a corner falls. Like, I would not mind that at all. Now, the Niners have never spent more than a third round pick on a corner. That's a good point. But do, does, is this the year of the change? I'd be cool with that. I'd be Because, I mean, what are you going to do next year? Demo, contract year. Yeah. yeah, last year for Charvarius Ward. Thomas just too. talked about Ambry Thomas probably gone. Like, who you got coming back? That's you a know, good point. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, you got now you got to look at Samuel Womack the third if he remains on this roster, right? You got to look at Darrell Luter Jr. You got to look at all these young guys that are in the building, and to me, that's where it kind of, eh, you know. And so I get it. Like, I would love for them to get just straight up nickel like rob said don't get a guy that has to develop there get a guy that knows how to play nickel now the only issue to me with sandra still is his weight but he plays big like he's good in tackling he'd be like and i'm not saying that because i'm a michigan fan like like yes, I, you are okay i am but he literally he literally does his thing hey rob subscribe to the wayne breezy channel too while you're watching the show appreciate you for for joining I'm a huge San, San still fan, by the way. I, I, he's a Michigan guy. He's smaller than we usually go. 5'10", yeah. 182. I got nickel only. That's what I'm but, saying. Uh, that's it. That's it. Like, that, that's, but it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. yeah. He that's plays it well. Thing. Like He has the instinct and the cognitive ability to know. He has the technique. He has the skill set. He might. He, he doesn't get overpowered, but... He gets to he gets to the outside. He gets to the run. He's great at diagnosing when it's a run play. He's great at his angles, um, and he he can take he can intercept the ball. Like you know, I like his nickname CEO. I freaking love that man. That is love his it. claim. And and this goes back to you know we were talking about taking a linebacker the third round. Look, the third linebacker plays twenty percent of the snaps in today's NFL. The Good nickel point. corner plays eighty percent. That's why I'm like, dude, I don't want to spend a third round pick on a linebacker. I would much rather spend a second or a third on a corner. And so my hesitation to drafting a linebacker in the third round, it's not like the player's bad or the fit's bad. It's just like, even if he's amazing, is he going to be better than Drake Greenlaw? Like, no. 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 And so this dude, we're drafted this dude who might play 20 plays a game, might. Whereas we have a nickel corner, we've got to have somebody that can play 50 plays a play, like, game. And so that's why I'm just like, man, I hope they prioritize this spot. Center and nickel corner are the two spots I really, really want to oh draft. Oh, my God. I haven't talked to you in a month. 
and I feel like you've been reading my mind. Um, and, and real quick, uh, I was just talking about the current 49ers not drafting a corner before the third round. Correct. So, yeah, I know that they've drafted the 49ers franchise-wise, but not John Lynch, Kyle Shanahan era. Let's talk about centers since we're there. Because if JPJ falls to 31, and you stare and staring you in the face is, is Graham Barton staring you in the face is uh, give me a tackle that Zach, might. F- oh, uh, I thought you, you got to throw my man Zach Frazier in there from West Virginia. Get, uh, Center. Zach love Frazier, him. love him. And give me another, give me a tackle that Jordan might. Jordan Morgan. Okay, there we go. There we go. Okay, these are four guys right there at 31. I feel like, okay, who would John choose for the 49ers? At 31. I, oh, Jackson Powers Johnson. Oh, okay. Uh, I just wanted to make sure we was on the same page. I mean, I, he's my number one. I like Zach, though. Zach Frazier I, out of West Virginia. If I'm looking for a true set, my center rankings are Jackson Powers Johnson, Zach Frazier, then Graham Barton, right? Those are my three Oh, so you're going to slide Graham over to the center. I thought he would be kicked over to the guard more. Yeah, I think, well, that's the thing about Graham is he can play tackle, guard, and center. Um, and I am with Daniel Jeremiah. I think that center could be a spot for him. It's a little bit more of a projection, but um, yeah, Jackson Powers Johnson's just so clean. Now the aggressive run blocking, all that stuff that Zach Frazier brings, that's pretty awesome. Um, he's the nasty, you know, mean as hell, tone setter, four time state champion wrestler. Like he's got all those things, and he's awesome. But uh, Jackson Powers Johnson's just too clean. He's just too clean. Let's talk about why the Niners like, and I, they've never done this. I've never seen Kyle Shanahan do this. So they've never drafted a center, especially this high. Like, matter of fact, the only center that they brought in was undrafted, if I'm not mistaken, and it was Donovan West out of Arizona. He uh, didn't make it through a week of training camp. <laughs> so, And I had uh, a third-round grade on him. We did. You, you absolutely did. Absolutely did. Um, when I look at Jackson Powers Johnson, that's – one of those players I told you I fell in love with. Like when you fall in love with a player, like you, you know, they have to really stand out. He didn't even practice much, and he was that good. Like at the Senior Bowl, but but we knew, like you know, and I just watching him with, like, when we were walking through like the 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 tunnel from like the main building and like walking, like I'm walking behind him, like this dude is big without pads. Like damn. Like this, and then you get the athleticism from him. And I know he might not have tested super duper well at the con. I don't care none about that. I know what you watch on the football film, and what you've seen him do. He's the he's the guy. Like I would target him if. And I'm not saying he's gonna fall at 31. I'm saying if there's a big if. Like it's a possibility the teams don't want the centers. It'd be stupid to pass up on this guy because of his athleticism and his ability and versatility to be able to play on that offensive line. You're not gonna get the super mean aggression, but you get the smart football player. Like I think you get, you get this you get this guy that knows how to play center, especially in the zone blocking schemes that the 49ers like to run. He would be the perfect fit for Kyle Shanahan. It, and is there is there any way you think the Niners may trade up? I don't like the idea of trading up for a center personally. I wouldn't be upset if they did it. And, you know, the the red flag on Jackson Powers Johnson, if there is one, it's just length. He's got short arms. Short arms. Short. Yeah. He's got small hands. So, like, Trent Baalke, uh, you know, those type of guys that are metric-based, I'd say the Colts, um, the Jaguars, just some off the top, like, probably not going to be super high on their list, but he's a perfect scheme fit for the 49ers. And so – if you traded up a couple spots and got them, I'd be cool with that. If you address the center position early, I don't care how you do it. I think that that is the easiest place to upgrade, you know, from where you are now to – I just think the run game would just take off, man. Ugh. For those that are new to the 49ers, for those that don't understand the zone scheme, even the power gapping, the running – John, can you explain to everybody very quickly, you know, why the center position is the most important position in, to Kyle Shanahan's offense, to run his offense? So it's the very – I love this question. One, the quarterback doesn't make line calls in Kyle Shanahan's offense. It's I'd say probably, well, now with the Shanahan tree exploding – most teams don't do that. The quarterback can adjust everything. That's why you always see Peyton Manning, 51's Mike, 51's Mike, and, you know, all that stuff. Quarterbacks in Brock Purdy doesn't have to do any of that. 
He counts and he can flip plays. That's the can can call uh, that you always see him doing. Just based off of numbers, we have straight numbers advantage to the right or left. That's about it. Or a two safety looking he can to a run play. But the center, he's the coach on the field, and you've still got to move laterally in this zone scheme, uh, the Shanahan Kubiak system much more so than a power gap or a pin-pull system. Now, the 49ers have trickled in a lot more pin-pull, probably about 15% of their run plays, which is a power gap scheme, or now terminology is inside zone. Um, so everything's getting multiple now, but you got to move as the center. And so that's why in Shanahan's scheme, long arms are not that important. Mobility is more important. So your big, heavy set, thick in the britches, you know, whatever, that doesn't really fit the zone scheme. That's why guys like Graham Barton could play tackle for the 49ers. Uh, that's why like people that are like, oh, Jordan Morgan's going to be a guard because he doesn't have 34-inch arms. Well, Colt McKivitz doesn't have 34-inch arms either. So is Colt McKivitz going to play tackle for the Titans? God, no. It's a different scheme. But for Kyle Shanahan, put Tom Compton out there, and it works. You don't need the I've been, I've been, I've been, I've been doing my due diligence and trying to explain, you know, you know the situation now like i said they can upgrade they can get players that they can upgrade but it's not all about the measurables for it's all about being able to get out quick off the snap get to your spot secure that block and because when Kyle Shanahan calls these plays i i guarantee you every play he calls john the touchdown it's touchdown it's touchdown you do this you do this you do this touchdown it's touchdown it's easy simple but everybody's got to do their part do their role floyd the barber says have you guys checked out tape on christian haynes you could check out john's film he breaks down the film uh oh, yeah. on these players and 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 i i've definitely got a chance to watch this one of your uconn boys this is one of my uconn boys uh so here let me before john breaks down what, what he's gonna say here's my thing on christian haynes i understand he's short i could care less that he's six two but you want a mean wrecking ball of a player on the offensive line at the guard pulling and doing the things that guards do this is the guy like this is my guy like this is a guy with draft at 63 if he's available i know john wants to go corner this is tough because i don't think he falls but past the th second round but this is a guy john christian haynes real quick you they know, need to it, watch your film though he's he's mean man like he watches Trent Williams. I can tell you that. He does the thing where he pulls the arms and then grabs the back and throws their face in the dirt. Like, he does it consistently. Now, my question is, and this is up, you know, matter of interpretation, is he just a guard? I have him great as just a guard. I know the senior bowl, he played center. He played center, and did yeah. well, but yeah. I see him as a guard only. But, you know, whatever. If the Niners took him and wanted to move to center, I'd be fine with that. The question is, the Niners have a lot of guards. And... <laughs> They they do, but they but okay. Let's talk about the guards that the Niners have. Not to you cut got, you off. You got Banks. You got Banks. Turf toe. He has not been the same, but you're expected recovery. Feliciano was awesome. I'd say he's the second best old lineman we have. I agree, but he's 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 versatile. So he could be center. He could be guard. Uh, oh, he could play I tackle. Would love. I would love Feliciano to play center. And that oh. yo, I I promise you, that's my that's my game thinking. Like oh. I'm thinking. You re-sign Feliciano. He competes with Jake Brindle, and possibly you upgrade there. You draft a guard that would solidify the right side. But what does that mean for Spencer Burford? Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think it's not his fault that Feliciano got hurt. I would argue, ah, uh, Banks. Burford was probably the worst player in the Super Bowl, him and Oren Burks, which are both backups that got thrust into starting roles because yeah, of injuries during the game. Yeah. But, uh, man, I, I, my whole thing is I'm not planning a future with Spencer Burford. I hope he returns to what he was his rookie year, but the consistency is so bad. I Anything you get from him is just extra. It's kind of like the Ambry Thomas thing. Like, look, man, you're on the roster and you're competing. You can show out. But we're not planning for you to help us in the future. We're going to move on um, unless you show us something. So, I mean, he's a cheap player. He's under contract. You don't cut him. Not talking about that. But you definitely can't go into the draft with, you know, Spitzer Burford in your plans, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, you you, you rated the offensive lineman. I, I think, it, you know, 
honestly, I didn't I didn't really think Banks was good either. Not, not after his injury. He was terrible. Yeah, the first few games of the year, he was like, Oh, yeah, he's the best yeah, player. He's the best offensive lineman. Last on the year was field. awesome. Yeah. And then and then after that, it was just like, you know, the injury happened and, and it's a setback. But like you said, you're 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 hoping he returns back to his regular natural form because when he's not injured, he's a top lineman, right? So you're not looking to replace anybody on the left side. But that right side could get better. And I think if you get better at the guard, like, you know, p- possibly McKivitz with the extension, uh, it, it, he upgrades a little bit because now he's not overcompensating on that right side. I think it was just tough. Like, people forget linemen overcompensate to help out, you know, and the, and the weight kind of just falls on him. I mean, he even got blamed <laughs> for that play at initially. We talk about the miss Chris Jones block. and, and That was all on Burford. It was it was all on Burford, you know. He Burford kicks to the inside, and so this is what football is all about, man. It's all about finding ways to get better. Shout out to my brother Eddie G and the B Dog, sixteen months as a Breezy Bunch crew member, man. Appreciate you, love you, my brother. Uh, love that. you, love you, love you. All right, so John, um, on the board, we talked about draft talk. On the board, you're at pick thirty one. You're not trading, uh, and, and you know, let's just say all the top. Offensive tackles are gone. Who are you drafting at 31? Who do you think the 49ers are drafting at 31? And we'll get up out of here. Okay, well, uh, John Lynch, Kyle Shanahan, we got to start on the defensive line. <laughs> if, if I got to know who's there. Is there a defensive tackle there? Or one of my two defensive there, there's, tackles there's, there? There's, there's one, of your, one of your two defense, one of your three it. defensive tackles are going to be there. Oh, you got three. I, only I got, got two. I, I got Rook up there. I got Rook. I got Rook. Potentially going into the first round. I love him. I have him in a tier by him. So my tiers for defensive tackle rankings: Byron Murphy, Johnny Newton. Those guys are wherever they, you they're got they're, they're ones. Yeah. Then I've got the Rook second tier is Rook and, by himself. Yeah, and then Sweat. And then no, I've got your boy. Uh, Chris oh, Jenkins. Chris Jenkins. Uh, then Sweat. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I got him, but I've flipped him a few times. Like, I, I, here, here's the thing about Sweat. I'm I'm confused how you stop him. I've watched. I, I, I don't you know what I tell you what you're a Texas fan so you would know better than I do but at the senior bowl against all the all-stars he was unstoppable there wasn't an offensive lineman combination that can stop him from getting pressure on the quarterback I'm confused but the dude is huge the dude is strong He's fun, man. He's one of the most high energy defensive linemen I've ever seen. Where like the whole team and crowd and stadium just reacts to his presence. Every game. Like it's just he fills the momentum bar completely full. And whenever he makes a play, you feel it and it echoes throughout the stadium. I'm I'm a huge sweat fan. I don't know if they'll go that big. That's too big. Pause. <laughs> that's 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 but I, I've got them both is. like right next to each other. Chris Jenkins, Tavadre Sweat, they're both going to kind of do the same thing. So you have Mitch Chris Jenkins. Stoppers. Chris Jenkins, in my opinion, would be top five, but you're missing out on Braden Fisk. I'm surprised. I, I did know- not like Fisk's tape. And I, okay. I, this is one thing I wanted to talk to you about because, okay, he comes, like I had like a third round grade on him, right? Okay. The combine happens. I'm like, good Lord. This guy is had the best combine I've ever seen in my life. Okay. The athleticism, all these things are incredible. Like, I love this guy. And then I go back and I was like, well, let's go watch the tape. The tape doesn't show that to me. Mm-hmm. He stays blocked all the time. Um, the tools are there. But then, so you're like, okay, the athleticism. All right, cool. You just got to uncork it. He's 24 years old. He's old. Mm-hmm. So then I'm like, okay, so he's a potential pick. But he's the oldest defensive tackle in the class. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, well, he just needs good coaching. He was with Western Michigan for four years. Then he goes to Florida State for one year. Like, how much potential are you going to have? This is like Brandon Whedon type quarterback. (laughs) And so I like him. I do like him. And I've got, you know, I've I've got a late second, early third round grade on him. Yeah, for me, it's definitely, it's, 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 uh. Be- because of the combine, he could potentially be a first rounder based off of athleticism. 
That would drive me nuts. Wait, could, like, it, I I'm just, not saying the Niners would draft him, but I yeah. think there's going to be a team where he'll find a place where he'll fit, he'll be worked, and he'll get in there, and he'll be able to make plays. I think that that's kind of like what's going to make him stand out. I mean, you look at guys like, you know, just edge rushers, other guys like like Max, the Max Crosbys, those type of players, man, like, you really didn't know much about them. And then they get into the NFL, and they just blossom, right? And then, like, this kid has something I feel like you can't teach and something that I actually watched, like, there – in living color at the senior bowl practices and that was his get off and that's the that's the immediate thing that drew me to him because when i spoke to him i was like dude like how like like how like how did you time every snap and beat every snap it's like you knew when they were gonna he's like yo it's just something that i had to i had to develop because i wasn't the biggest i wasn't the fastest i wasn't the strongest you know what i'm saying and so i'm like okay but literally john He's going to get drafted higher than where you have him graded because of certain tendencies that he does have that he does well. I think everything else you can work with, and he's he's going to be a rookie, so you're, you're gonna, he's going to get time to play. I'm not saying he's going to come in and give you 10 double-digit sacks as a rookie, but depending on where he goes and depending on the attention, he was yeah. winning his one-on-ones, right? And See, then, I feel like this is a practice warrior guy. Like, yeah, you fair. put the ads on – and it's like, man, look like Tarzan, play like Jane. I'm not going that far <laughs> on him, but I'm just saying, like, sometimes when the game starts, players kind of disappear. This dude kind of stood out to me. And again, the age is an issue. The age Byron could be Murphy an issue. And Johnny Newton will play three years yeah. into their rookie deal and then be the age he is now. I got you. I, I this is not it's not a 49er pick. I'm he just probably saying. wouldn't be on my board if I was the 49ers GM. And like, I understand would, that. Like, I just, no, I, I just, for me, it's a no. I understand why people love them and they're mm -hmm. not wrong. It's opinion. They, this is what's so cool about the draft. You could love them. I could hate them. And I don't mm -hmm. hate them. I just, you don't think he fits question marks there. Yeah, yeah. He's not, he wouldn't be a good fit. There's a bunch of things that kind of make you, there's some flags that make you stand out. Right. And the way you watch film is the way you watch. If, if I, if, if you were defensive line tackle film, I want you to focus on defensive tackles in the draft. And I'm telling you, I want you to find me a defensive tackle. I'm not going to question why you chose not to go that route if you found these red flags and you didn't think it were going to fit. I'm going to trust your judgment. I asked you to do a job. I'm expecting you to do a job. If he comes in the NFL and he flashes, I'm going to be like, John, what happened? <laughs> what happened, yeah. John? Like, you, you know, but that's what happens, man. Like, it's just part of the game. Floyd the Barber says, what do you think of Jackson McKinley? Uh, or Justin, uh, I can't say his last name, but he's out of Alabama. McKinley, I believe, is out of Mississippi State, I believe. Yeah, I, I really remember. liked McKinley a lot. Um, but Justin, a big yagne, I don't know. Uh, I liked him, you know, started as a true freshman, played as a true freshman in Alabama, which is, you know, huge, improved every year, could play all over the place, 6'5, 292, uh, fun player, a lot of production for Alabama which is kind of rare because they rotate their guys so much. He had seven sacks. So I like him. Um, you know, late fourth rounder, I think if he goes there. Now, McKinley, that's one of my guys, man. Like, he is one of my favorite players. McKinley the Jackson. The Niners spoke to him, too, I believe. Was it McKinley Jackson he was asking about out of Texas A&M? Yeah, Texas A&M. Yeah. And Texas I hate Texas A&M. I can't stand him. I, I love that they had the best moment of March Madness and still lost. That made me happy. Um I hate Texas. Did they hit the buzzer then lose in overtime, right? Yeah, see? That's awesome. I'm just trying to relive that because it was mm -hmm. awesome. Um, but he met with the 49ers, 6'2", 325. He's a bigger defensive tackle than the Niners usually go after. Uh, DJ Jones, whenever he came out of college, is what his body looks like. Not DJ Jones now, not the good DJ Jones. He had to go through three years of transformation to get good. So he's a little bit of the pre-draft DJ Jones. But, man... My favorite thing about it, I wrote this like over and over again. Heart, effort, hustle, all out every play. Loves the game. Like this dude loves football. Uh, McKinley Jackson. I, I like. I just want guys like that. And my comp for him, even though he's built completely different, the play style comp was Mozzie Smith. They don't look alike, hmm. but I felt like they play alike. So okay. he does it with energy, whereas Mozzie does it just with unreal athleticism and build. But so right. yeah, I like. So that. here's here's the multi million dollar question: John Lynch drafted a defensive tackle. Two guys are available: Brian Murphy, Jerzon Newton. Who, and don't be biased. This is a not a non biased question. Who is John Chapman drafting at thirty one? 
Byron Murphy. Oh yeah, it was it was no what, really I, over over Drazon? He's my favorite player of the draft. Like I'm gonna have him ten to twelve. Like I'm still working on it. I love him. I, I, there's I can't find nothing wrong with him. And I love Johnny Newton. His tape, he didn't he did have the motor all the time. And like he's coming he, off the injury, too. So now, like, having said that, Johnny Newton played like 700 snaps. Byron yeah. Murphy played like 400. 400 like, snaps. That dude was out there every play. So I get it. I, I, I don't want to knock him against that because he's playing twice as much as everybody else is. But Texas had a rotation. And so, man, I just – the fact that Byron Murphy played the nose guard when Sweat was next to him that's crazy and sweat the bigger the bigger guy 16 right pounds yeah, I know. bigger I, like I, I this understand. dude is a dog man Ugh. he's definitely a dog um and you know in a couple of my mock drafts both were available and i immediately like ran in with the pick like you know if and, and not both were available i mean one was available one mock draft one was available another mock draft and i clearly looked over offensive line like none of that mattered because if i'm not getting you know uh, uh, Fuaga out of Oregon State. I really don't want anybody. Like that's my number one. That's he's awesome. That's who I want. If I'm not getting him, cool. I'll wait till later. But with those guys being available, it was either Byron Murphy and I've, if you could check my mock drafts, see my write ups. It was either him or Jerzar Newton if they're made available. If those guys aren't available, do you go corner if a Kool Aid McKinstry is available? I don't mind. Yeah, I'm I'm cool with that. And probably one of the things I've learned by doing so many mock drafts is, let's say a, a defensive tackle falls in the first, second, or third round. Okay, I'm always like the next round, like, oh, there's another good DT there. Oh, but I already took one. I say that all the time because this draft is loaded, loaded. with quality defensive tackles throughout the whole damn draft. Agreed. And so that's the one hang up I have on Disagree. drafting a defensive tackle early. Yeah, cause because you can get you can get a Christian Boyd, you can yeah. get, you know, th there's some guys though. There's some there's some dogs. There are so corner. I would have no problem with it. We talked a little bit about this. Like you win nickel though. I'm going <sighs> lockdown outside. Bad man. He's he's bad man. Let's do ran a four four seven with a that Jones be, fracture. You got Kool Aid. <laughs> that that means you're moving Demo's on from, going inside. Timo's yes. going inside. Yeah. And it just shores up your future. Now you got this lockdown premier guy for five years, and you may not extend a guy like Mooney Ward. You give Demo his extension, and you can and kick him back to outside and possibly have – oh, this is crazy. Who Who's our DC now, right? Good. Guess what position he coaches? Point. Nichols. Nichols. Good point. John. This has been great, man. Hey, it's been fun. Like, like if you're up on Mondays, man, and you want to join me at the end of a week, let's do it. And then maybe next Monday we could do our first mock draft, which will be an April show, which will be three weeks to the draft. John, are you going to the draft this year? I don't think so. I'm trying to organize something. I'm in the beginning stages where we do a party here in San Francisco. Okay. Low key, chill. Sounds I don't want to go better. hardcore. Yeah. I, hardcore is so tiring. I it want low key, is. chill. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately i won't be attending either um i got some some bills to pay here at home but i will be bringing you guys draft shows uh and we'll be doing a lot of stuff so this is going to be fun but john you always a pleasure john you know how we do we sign off man you get to sign us off thank you everybody for tuning in i just wanted to shout out everybody to all the crews out there the countdown crew the breezy bunch crew we appreciate you and if you want to see more of john and wayne just leave some comments in the comment section whether you're listening or you're watching the show don't forget to hit that like button john take us home this is fun man and the draft time is always good time and don't let all the rumors and whatever and clickbait take away the joy and the hope of looking forward i understand we're still hurt from the super bowl letdown that sucked but we're projected to have the most wins uh, for this upcoming year. And so these are good times to be 49ers fans. And with that, Wayne, thank you. And for everybody else out there, stay strong and faithful. I be sipping go for whiskey on the rocks. And a 24 karat gold on a watch. My 7 1 Chevy be tipping nonstop. Sounding like Trent Williams on the block. So you know we can't stop. We be banging through your speakers. Wayne Breezy on the filter in the bleachers. You can tune into my show and I'm a teacher. Wayne Breezy, the phone I preacher.